lives. That women's lives have changed so much that they expect more from men and they're more disappointed. I think that's really what some of these data might suggest. So let me, let me begin by suggesting some of the ways in which women's lives have changed over the past, say, 35 or 40 years. Now the first area of change, I'll point to four of them. The first area of change in women's lives over the past 30 or 40 years is so obvious I know I don't have to tell you, and that is women made gender visible. We now know that gender is one of the organizing principles of social life. Gender is one of the basic, fundamental building blocks of our identity. <coughs> the thing is, 40 years ago, we didn't know this. 40 years ago, if you went to graduate school anywhere in the country and said, I want to study gender, there was not one course you could take. In fact, if you went to graduate school 40 years ago and said, I want to study women in my field in, in, in sociology, there was one course you could take. It was called Marriage and the Family. For years, that was like the ladies' auxiliary of the social sciences. Today, of course, there are women's studies courses, gender studies courses on every campus in the country. Students often don't realize just how recent this is. The first women's studies program in the United States was founded in 1972 at San Diego State. It is that recent. That's the first area of change in women's lives. Women made gender visible. A second area of change in women's lives is around the workplace. It's the largest transformation of the labor force in our history. Now, well, let me ask you, how many of the women here who are students here at Middlebury, how many of you expect to have full-time jobs outside the home when you graduate from college? Let me see your hands. Okay, now keep your hands up, please, if your mother had or has a career outside the home for at least 10 years with no interruptions. This is your mom. Okay, how about grandmothers? Great. Okay, thanks. This is what I typically get at most of the places that, uh, that I lecture, which is when I ask you, every hand goes up. When I ask about mothers, about three-quarters of the hands stay up. When I ask about grandmothers, about 10%. What you see in this room is that women's experiences and expectations around the labor force have changed <coughs> fundamentally in three short generations. <coughs> now, what would happen if I asked the men the same question, how many of the men expect to have full-time jobs outside the home when you graduate from college? So we knew that. <laughs> because men's relationship to the workplace, and it would stay up for father, grandfather, great-grandfather, because men's relationship to the workplace hasn't changed at all. And that's led to a third area of change in women's lives, and that is the balance between work and family. Not that long ago, remember your hands about grandma, not that long ago, women believed they had to choose between having careers outside the home and having family lives. Well, today, of course, women are unwilling to make that choice. Women want to be able to balance work and family. Women want to be able to have careers. They want to have family lives. They want, as we, you know, that you, you, you've run across that wonderful phrase, can women have it all? Can women have exciting, glamorous careers outside the home and warm, loving, supportive families to come home to? And the answer, of course, to that question, can women have it all, is no. The reason women can't have it all is because men do. <laughs> We're the ones who have the careers outside the home and the warm, loving, supportive families to come home to because women do the second shift. Women do the housework. Women do the childcare. We have it all. So if women are going to be able to balance work and family, we men are going to have to do something different. And I will return to this in a minute. The fourth area of change in women's lives is around sexuality. Now this is by far the hardest one for us guys to wrap our heads around because we thought the sexual revolution was all about us. I mean, the sexual revolution promised more access to more partners with fewer commitments. Could you come up with a more masculine definition of a sexual revolution than that? But if you look at the mountain of sex research data that has been collected over the past 30 or 40 years, there's only one conclusion you would come to, and that is it is women's sexuality that's changed not men's. Now the easiest way to summarize this change in women's sexuality is to say women today feel entitled to pleasure. Women today know that they can like sex, want sex, go for it, get horny. And I'm not talking about some bohemian radical enclave in Greenwich Village or San Francisco here. I am talking about mainstream American mall-going Victoria's Secret wearing women. Now, 
I'm a social scientist, so you're probably saying, well, how do you prove that empirically? <laughs> and I got to say, you know, those of you who have ever taken a course in, in, in social science know we, we social, social scientists, we can only think in four categories, you know, a lot, some, a little, or nothing. <laughs> and this is not the kind of data, you can't generate some kind of empirical measure of this that, that's, that has, that's based on an attitude survey. You know, I can't say that. Now, how sexually agentic do you feel? A lot, some, a little, not at all. You'd get no useful data with an attitude survey. You need a behavioral measure of sexual entitlement, of entitlement to pleasure. I got one for you. How about masturbation? The dead silence. <laughs> Never fails to amaze me. You know, I, I, teach, a course, I teach a course at Stony Brook um, I, called Sex and Society to 420 students, right? A course on intimacy. Um, and my students would be perfectly happy, in fact, they'd be delighted to talk about the most esoteric, bizarre sexual perversion that like two people do. But talk about masturbation, which virtually everyone's doing. Oh, no, please don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> but think about it. Isn't masturbation the best behavioral measure of your entitlement to pleasure you could possibly come up with? I'm so entitled to pleasure, I'll do it myself. <laughs> so let's look at the data. 1954, Alfred Kinsey, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. 41% of American women over 25 had ever masturbated. 1954, 41%. In 1996, the single largest survey, the single most comprehensive survey of American sexual behavior ever undertaken in our history at the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, found that 90% of American women had masturbated. Now that is a really big change in a short time. Comparable rates for men, Alfred Kinsey, 1948, sexual behavior in the human male, 96% of men. 1996, social organization of sexuality, 97% of men. Not a big change there. Here's another behavioral measure of sexual entitlement or sexual agency. Not its presence, but its absence. In 1975, sociologist Lillian Rubin did a study of working class women in the San Francisco Bay Area. And she found, remember again how we think, a lot, some, a little, or nothing. 40% of the women she interviewed in 1975 said that they sometimes, or even more often than sometimes, faked orgasm. Now that's a pretty good behavioral measure of not claiming your own sexuality, not claiming your own sexual agency. In 1995, 20 years later, she goes back to that same neighborhood and interviews women again. Some of the women she interviews in 1995 are the daughters of the women she had interviewed 20 years earlier. Now she finds fewer than 10% of the women say they ever fake orgasm. Again, that's a big change in a short time. There is no sex research data on men faking orgasm, so I can't give you a gender comparison here. But I think you get the idea that in four very fundamental ways, identity, work, family, intimacy, women's lives have changed fundamentally in the past 30 or 40 years. So while women's lives have been changing so much, what's been happening with men? That's the result of the survey, it seems to me. What most of you are probably saying to yourself is, not very much. I think that's only half true. I think back, for example, to the world my father lived in. My father went to an all-male college, served in an all-male military, and spent his entire working life in an all-male work environment. Well, I would say to the men in this room, that world is gone. There are only three all-male colleges left in America. There is no more all-male military. And there's virtually no job you will have where you won't have women colleagues, coworkers, supervisors, or bosses. So men's lives have changed a lot. What has not changed, however, is what we think it means to be a man. Survey after survey of college-age men today find that college-age men today subscribe to the same ideology of masculinity that I did when I was in college, that my dad did when he was. The ideology of masculinity remains relatively the same. One psychologist once came up with what he called the four basic rules of manhood. So guys, if any of you are having any doubts or questions, just memorize these rules, get them right every second, <laughs> and you'll be OK. Here's the first rule. In fact, just get the first one right, OK? No sissy stuff. You can never 
do anything that even remotely hints of femininity.